Thomism in the present day. At the conclusion of my last lecture, I pointed out that the most important factors in the scholastic school of thought were the problems which presented themselves at that time in a very definite way to the human soul, and which resulted in an intense desire to discover how man could attain the knowledge which is essential for human life, and at the same time how this knowledge could be made to fit in with the content of the faith of the Western Christian Church, which in those days governed the social relationships of mankind. In contending with these problems, the scholastics had first of all to face the awakening consciousness of human individuality. This consciousness, as we have seen, was in a state of continuous development, but it was no longer able to carry its newly acquired knowledge up to the old level of an actual spirit content, though gleams of this still appeared even at that time in what survived of Neoplatonism and in the teachings of Dionysus the Areopagite and of Scotus Origina. I also pointed out that these weighty and profound problems and the form and manner in which they were presented in scholasticism exercised a great influence for a long period of time. In point of fact, and this is really the subject of this final lecture, the greatest problem of them all namely the relationship of mankind to sensory and spiritual reality is still with us today and confronts us to a large extent in the spiritual life of the present time. Mankind, however, is almost unconscious of this. For the problem today takes a form very unlike scholasticism, having been radically changed as a result of the approach to it by the leading philosophers in the subsequent course of European history. <laughs> if we pass from Thomas Aquinas to that Franciscan monk, Dun Scotus, who probably originated from Ireland and at the beginning of the 14th century taught in Paris and subsequently in Cologne, we see that he confronted the same question, quote, how does the psychic element in man live in his physical organism, close quote. The problem, however, had already become too great, even for that wonderful technique of thought that had been derived from those past masters in the art of thinking, the scholastics. Thomas Aquinas, as we have seen, had already come to the conclusion that the psychic element worked actively upon the whole bodily organism. He held that when a man through conception and birth enters upon his physical existence, he is equipped by physical heredity only with the forces of mineral substance, of organic growth, and of sense perception. There then entered into him, there then enters into him, but without any idea of pre existence, the pure intellect or the active intellect, that which Aristotle calls the nous poeticos, the creative understanding. Now, as Thomas Aquinas saw it, the nous poeticos first absorbs into itself all the soul element in the human being, the forces of growth and of sentient life, and then works upon the bodily element so as to transmute the whole into a complete totality with itself. Finally, it passes into an immortal existence, united with that which it has won from the human organism, into which it had itself entered from eternal heights, but without any individual pre-existence. Footnote, see page 80, and a footnote. <coughs> Dun Scotus could not in any way bring himself to believe in such a process of absorption of the whole organic and dynamic system of the human being by the active understanding. He could only believe that the human bodily organism exists as something complete in itself. Throughout the duration of life, the vegetative and animal principles of growth retain a sort of independent existence, but they are discarded at death 
and only the pure spiritual principle, the active understanding of Aristotle, passes over into immortality. <laughs> Equally little could Scotus accept the idea which Thomas Aquinas entertained of the permeation of the whole body by the human psychic spiritual element. The idea was as impossible to him as it was later on to his pupil William Ockham, who died at Munich in the fourteenth century and whose chief characteristic was that he made an absolute return to nominalism. Footnote, quote, Ockham was a thinker of a different caste, representing as against the platonic realism of Duns Scotus the most developed form of medieval nominalism. In their different ways, both developments contributed to upset the balance of the scholastic irenicon between science and faith. And irenicon is E-I-R-E-N-I-C-O-N, irenicon. Hmm. The rapidity with which the disintegration was now going on may be judged from the fact that Occam died about 1349, that is, before the end of the half-century, which had seen the composition of the Divina Commedia. Close quote from Thomas Whitaker, the Neoplatonist, 2nd edition, page 194, in the footnote. To Occam, the human intellect no longer represented any spirit reality, but had become something abstract, merely a human quality, won by sense observation and reflection. He could no longer bring himself to believe that the source of reality was to be found only in the universals, in ideas. He reverted to the nominalistic view that what establishes itself in man as an idea, a general concept, is merely acquired by reflection, as an abstraction from the world of sense experience. In point of fact, it can be described as something which lives in the human spirit as a quote-unquote name or a word, merely for the convenience of forming a comprehensive picture of phenomena. Thus Occam reverted completely to nominalism. It is a very significant fact that the nominalism of Rosalind, which had threatened the doctrine of the Trinity, had been merely interrupted for a while by the intensive thought activity of Albertus Magnus and Thomas Aquinas and others. And that after their day, Europe relapsed into it again. Nominalism is really the incapacity of the human sense of individuality in its continual struggle upward into clear consciousness to grasp as actual spirit reality that which is present in the mind only in the form of ideas. The incapacity to grasp it as something which is an actual, active spirit entity in man, and also, in a sense, in things. Thus, from being realities, in quotes, ideas become again, in quotes, names, merely empty abstractions. One can see the difficulties which European thought encountered in ever greater degree as it opened up the question of the nature of knowledge. For in the end, human beings must acquire knowledge through ideas, especially in the earlier stages. <clears throat> and the great question always keeps coming up, quote, how do ideas convey to us reality? Close quote. Actually, an answer becomes almost impossible if ideas appear to us as merely names, void of reality, we see then that ideas which for the ancient Greeks, or at any rate for those initiated into the mysteries, had been the ultimate manifestation from above of a real spirit world, became for the European consciousness more and more abstract. Indeed, this process of abstraction, this process of ideas, becoming merely names, increased more and more with the further development of Western thought. At a later stage, certain individuals lift themselves above it, as, for example, Leibniz, who never embarked on the question as to how man gets knowledge from ideas, for he still held to the tradition of a genuinely spiritual point of view and ascribed everything to individual world monads, 
which are actual spirit. Leibniz towers over the rest in that he has the courage to present the world as spiritual. For him the world is Holy Spirit. Its existence is derived from pure spiritual entities. It must, however, be admitted that that which an earlier age, with a knowledge more direct and instinctive, though not yet lit up by the logic of scholasticism, had regarded as differentiated spiritual individualities, was for Leibniz more or less a series of graduated spiritual points, the monads. Individuality is secured, but only in the form, so to speak, of elemental spiritual points. But if we accept, but if we accept Leibniz, it may be said that the whole Western world, in its intense struggle to arrive at certainty about the origins of existence, was quite unable to solve this nominalist problem. A marked example of this is found in Descartes, that thinker who lived during the first half of the seventeenth century and who was rightly placed at the beginning of modern philosophy. Every history of philosophy teaches us to recognize as the basis of the Cartesian philosophy the sentence cogito ergo sum, or cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. There is something in this sentence of the striving of Augustine. For Augustine struggled out of his doubt by saying, quote, I can doubt the existence of everything, but the fact of doubt itself remains, and as long as I am in doubt, I am still alive. I can doubt the existence of the sense world around me. I can doubt the existence of God, of clouds, of stars. But as long as I am in doubt, I cannot doubt the existence of the doubt within me. I cannot doubt what is actually going on in my own soul. There I have a certainty, something to lay hold of as a certain starting point. Close quote. Descartes takes up this same thought again when he says, I think, therefore I am. I know, of course, that I am running the risk of being completely misunderstood in putting forward a quite simple objection to a statement of such recognized historical importance. However, I must take the risk. The thought that presented itself to Descartes and to many of those who followed him, and in this manner he had innumerable followers, was this, quote, If I have in my consciousness some content of thought, if I think, it is impossible to deny the fact that I am thinking. If so, I must be existing, and my existence is assured through my thinking. I know myself to be rooted, so to speak, in the being of the world, now that I have assured myself of my own being through my thinking. Close quote. Thus, modern philosophy really begins as intellectualism, as a rationalism which uses thought only as an instrument. To this extent, it is only an echo of scholasticism, which had turned so wholeheartedly toward intellectualism. There are two observations which we must make about the, this saying of Descartes. In the first place, we must raise a simple objection. Is my existence really dependent upon the fact that I think? Each night's sleep proves the contrary quite easily. For we know every morning when we awake that we must have continued to exist from the previous evening to the morning, but we have not been thinking. This simple fact, which I might call a sort of Columbus's egg, must be set against this famous widely accepted sentence. Footnote. Steiner's claim to have disproved Descartes' famous cogito ergo sum by the fact that we do not cease to exist in sleep, when we cease to think, may not appear to be logically sound. For the words, I think, therefore I exist, do not themselves imply that man only exists when he is thinking, any more than Augustine's proof of his existence because of his doubt would imply that he must always be doubting. Descartes, however, passed on to conclusions that Augustine did not make vis-à-vis that inasmuch as my existence has been proved by the fact that I think, therefore it is only as a thinking being that I exist. 
To this conclusion, Steiner's counter-argument is logically relevant. Uh, and a footnote. There is another and most important point that I want to make about Descartes. What is the aim of all Descartes' philosophical endeavor? With him, philosophy is no longer directed toward an understanding of life or the discovery of some secret of the universe for human consciousness. It is turned toward something entirely concerned with the intellect and with thought. It is directed to the question, how can I gain certainty? How can I free myself from doubt? How can I make sure that things really exist, that I myself really exist? It is no longer a question that is concerned with objective phenomena or that directs itself to the content of fact which is the result of man's observation of the world. It is entirely concerned with the certainty of knowledge. This question arose out of the nominalism of the scholastics, which Albertus and Thomas Aquinas had overcome for a short time, but which, after their day, appeared again. For it is manifest that the nominalists, when they seek to penetrate to the ideas within them, and which they designate as mere names, are seeking to find somewhere in their soul a point from which they can fashion for themselves not a world picture of reality, but merely the certainty that everything is not deception or untruth. The certainty that both when a man looks out into the world and when he looks into his own soul, he is looking at reality. In all this it is clear, as I pointed out at the end of the last lecture, that human individuality had arrived at intellectualism and had not discovered the relationship of Christ to the realm of intellect and thought. Augustine had been in some measure aware of this Christ relationship, because he still regarded humanity as a single whole. In his day the light of Christ shone, if somewhat faintly, in the depths of the soul of humanity, and it lit up again later for the Christian mystics of the Middle Ages. It did not, however, shine at all clearly or plainly for those later philosophers who sought to find Christ only by means of that logical thought which was bound up with their awakening sense of individuality or by that which could follow from it. <laughs> for this logical thinking, when it first arises, appears so definitely to have its source in the human soul itself that it rejects just that which ought to be the essential work of Christ on man's inner life. It rejects the possibility of transformation, of the metamorphosis of man's thought life. It cannot take the attitude toward the life of knowledge that would enable a man to say, quote, I can certainly think, and I think in the first place about myself and the world, but this thinking of mine is still very undeveloped. That, in some measure, is the result of the fall of man. My thinking, therefore, must rise above its present level. It must be transformed and lifted up into a higher sphere of consciousness. Close quote, footnote. The last few years this conception of the transformation of human thinking has found expression in the writings of leading thinkers, for example, Sir James Jeans, Dr. Maurice Nicole, and Nicholas Burgiev. End of footnote. As a matter of fact, only in one instance has the realization of this vital necessity for the transformation of human thought flashed up in the mind of a leading thinker, and that was Spinoza, himself a follower of Descartes. It is not to be wondered at that Spinoza made a very deep impression on men, like Herder and Goethe. But though he is apparently completely immersed in that intellectualism which in a changed form had survived from scholasticism, yet he takes the attitude toward intellectualism that man can only in the end really arrive at truth, which for Spinoza was a kind of intuition, if he is not content to remain at the level of everyday life and of ordinary scientific thinking, but transforms his intellect, the inner thought life of his soul. 
Spinoza finally arrives at the point when he can say, quote, By the development of thought itself, thought fills itself anew with a spirit content. Close quote. It is as though the spirit world, of which we learned in Platinism, offers itself again to thought, if thought will go forward to meet the spirit. Spirit replenishes thought until thought becomes intuition. <clears throat> to my mind, it is very interesting to see how Spinoza gets to the root of the matter when he says, quote, As we consider the life of the world, we see how, in its highest substance, it transforms itself again into spirit. We see, too, how we can receive this spirit into our souls if we raise both ourselves and our thinking to the level of intuition. That is, if we so develop our intellectual faculties that we prove everything with mathematical accuracy, and at the same time, in arriving at such proof, so transform and uplift ourselves that spirit can come to meet us. If we can rise to this height, then from that peak of vision we are able to comprehend the whole historic process which is involved in the evolution of mankind. Close quote. It is amazing that the following sentence should shine out from the writings of the Jew Spinoza. Quote, the highest revelation of divine substance is given in Christ. In Christ, intuition becomes theophany, the incarnation of God. The voice of Christ is therefore the voice of God and the path to salvation. Close quote. Footnote Steiner himself experienced this whole process. See Epilogue, page 143, and a footnote. In other words, the Jew, Spinoza, comes to the conclusion that man can so develop himself by means of his intellectual faculties that spirit comes to meet him. If then he is also able to fix his thoughts upon the mystery of Golgotha, not only does this spirit-filled consciousness become intuition, that is, the manifestation of spirit through thought, but intuition itself is transformed into theophany, the manifestation of God himself. Man is on the spirit path to God. Utterances like these show that Spinoza felt the urge to reveal the truth that had suddenly dawned upon him. What Spinoza had discovered by this means concerning the evolution of humanity runs, as it were, like a refrain, a kind of undertone, throughout his ethics. Title Ethics Later on this perception passed on to another sensitive human being. We can well understand how for Goethe, who was well able to read between the lines of the book and who could feel in his own heart the beat of the heart that lives in it, how for him the ethics of Spinoza set the standard of all his own thinking. In matters of this sort, it is important not to take the merely abstract point of view that is usually taken up in works on philosophy. The matter must be viewed from the human standpoint, and we must pay real attention to the spark that was lit by Spinoza's teaching in the soul of Goethe. That spiritual perception, however, which shines out between the lines of Spinoza's philosophy, did not become a dominating influence upon the thought of that time. What did dominate it was the inability to escape from nominalism. Indeed, at the next stage of nominalism, man became more and more entangled in the thought that there lives in him an inner consciousness which the outer world cannot comprehend and which cannot itself go out from him and immerse itself in the outer world and take to itself something of its nature. In fact, this feeling that man is so isolated in his own being that he cannot get away from himself and receive something from the outer world is to be found in the 17th century in Locke. He expresses it thus, quote, that which we observe as colors or as sounds in the outer world can no longer be regarded as anything which leads us to the reality of that world. It is only the effect of the outer world upon our senses, something by means of which we are ever more and more enveloped in the web of our own subjectivity. 
Close quote. That is one line of approach to the question. The other approach is seen in such minds as that of Francis Bacon in the 16th and 17th centuries. With him, nominalism has become such a thoroughgoing and avowed philosophy that he says, quote, We must sweep away man's false belief in a reality which is, in point of fact, nothing but a name. Reality only presents itself to us when we look out upon the world of the senses. The senses alone provide us with realities, the realities of empirical knowledge. Close quote, footnote. This is an anticipation of the complete intellectual fall of man from all connection with the divine spiritual, which is characteristic of modern scientific thinking. End of footnote. In comparison with these realities, those around which Albertus and Thomas Aquinas built up their theory of rational knowledge, no longer have, in Bacon's eyes, any scientific significance. For him, the spiritual world has evaporated into something which can never well up from the inner life of man with any scientific certainty or security. The spiritual world has become only the content of faith and must not be brought into contact with what is known as science or knowledge. On the other hand, knowledge can be achieved only by external observation or by experiment, which is only a more intellectual form of external observation. So we arrive at Hume in the 18th century, for whom even the connection between cause and effect has become something which exists only in man's subjective consciousness and which he applies to objects only from some sort of acquired habit. We see how the nominalism which followed Thomism weighed down upon humanity like a mountain. Now, what is the most important factor in the events which led up to this? Surely it is that the time at which scholasticism with its penetrating logic arose was the very time when the content of reason was being separated from the content of truth about the spiritual world. The task of the scholastics was to consider on the one hand the content of truth about the spiritual world, which for them, of course, was handed down through faith and revelation, and on the other hand to consider the truths which human knowledge could arrive at by its own power. Now, in their approach to this problem, the scholastics were quite unable to achieve, excuse me, were quite unable to perceive that the course of events would present their successors with a new problem. When Thomas Aquinas and Albertus had to develop their philosophies, there was as yet no scientific view of the world. There had as yet been no Galileo, no Giordano Bruno, no Copernicus, no Kepler. Man had not directed his powers of thought to the external world of nature. There was no necessity at that time to reconcile the knowledge which human reason could acquire from the depths of man's soul with that which had been won from the outer empirical world of sense experience. The only issue was between the knowledge which logical thinking could derive from the human soul and the content of spiritual truth handed down by the church to man. For men were no longer able by individual inner development to raise themselves to the actual reality which was embodied in the holy wisdom, but could only see it in the form in which it was handed down by the church, that is, as tradition or scripture, but the question that the future would have to answer was this, quote, What is the relation between the rational content of the highly developed theories of knowledge of Albertus and Thomas Aquinas and the content of the natural scientific view of the world? Close quote. The attempt to answer this question went on fruitlessly right into the 19th century. <clears throat> and now we discover a most remarkable fact. When we look back into the 13th century to see Albertus and Aquinas 
presenting humanity with a line of demarcation between rational knowledge and the content of faith and revelation. Step by step, they consider the truth of the content of revelation, but show that only up to a certain point does it yield to human understanding, and that beyond this point it remains for man a cosmic riddle. These cosmic riddles, such as the Incarnation, the real presence in the sacrament of the altar, and that's capital R, capital P, the real presence in the sacrament of the altar, and others stand on the further side of the boundary. For Albertus and Aquinas, man stands on this side, bounded by the limits of his own understanding and unable to look directly into the spiritual world. That was the situation in the 13th century. Now, if we turn to the 19th century, we shall see a remarkable fact. In the 1870s, at a famous conference of natural scientists at Leipzig, Dubois Raymond gave an impressive address on the boundaries of the knowledge of natural science. The situation has completely changed. Beyond the boundary of knowledge at which man stands, there now lies the material world, the atoms, everything of which Dubois Raymond says we, quote, we do not know what that is which masquerades in the world as a matter. <clears throat> Close quote. While on this side of the boundary lies the whole system of knowledge reached by the human mind. Although the presentation of this in the 70s by Dubois Raymond is insignificant in comparison with the mighty achievements of scholasticism, which lit up the Middle Ages, we are nevertheless confronted with a real antithesis. In the 13th century, man sought to understand the mysteries of the spiritual world. Now he seeks to understand the mysteries of the material world. <clears throat> now the boundary of knowledge is drawn between human beings and atoms. Then it lay between human beings and God and the angels. As a result of the influence of Hume, there arose a philosophy which had at any rate great contemporary importance, the philosophy of Kant. <clears throat> Ever since, in the 1860s, after it had suffered a slight eclipse, German philosophers raised the cry, quote, back to Kant, close quote. Mankind has stood very much under the influence of this philosophy. <clears throat> Innumerable books on Kant have been published, and independent thinkers on Kantian lines have appeared, such as Folkelt, Cohen, and a host of others. We can, of course, give here only a sketch of Kant, pointing out the essential features of his philosophy. I do not think that anyone who has made a serious study of Kant will disagree with my account of him in my short thesis, titled Truth and Science. For Kant, the problem which confronted him with full force at the end of the 60s and the beginning of the 70s of the 18th century was not the problem of the content of a world philosophy, nor the presentation in clear forms, images, or ideas of the nature of concrete reality. His problem was the formal problem of knowledge. Quote, How do we gain certainty about anything in the outer world that it really exists? Close quote. Kant is more concerned about the question of the certainty of knowledge than about any content of knowledge. One cannot help feeling when one studies his critiques, that what matters for Kant is not the content of knowledge, but the effort to reach the principle of certainty in knowledge. Read his title Critique of Pure Reason and his title Critique of Practical Reason, and note how, when he has completed the chapter on space and time, in its own way a sort of classic, he then produces the categories enumerated in a quite pedantic way, as though merely to put a finishing touch to the picture. <clears throat> in truth, the theme of the title Critique of Pure Reason has not the flow of something written sentence by sentence with a man's life blood. The relation of what we call concepts to some external reality is a far more important question for Kant than the whole content of knowledge which they in fact embody. He pieces together this content, as it were, from all the philosophy that he has inherited. 
He devises schemes and systems. But the question keeps on arising, how can man arrive at certainty, the sort of certainty, as he himself expressed it, which mathematics provides? Finally, he arrives at such a certainty by a device which, although it is changed in appearance and is exceptionally well concealed and disguised, is nothing else but nominalism. Nominalism stretched to include space and time, the forms of sense experience, as well as ideas and universal concepts. That, he says, which we evolve in our souls as the content of knowledge is in no sense whatsoever derived from the concept, uh, excuse me, derived from the objects we observe. We merely attach it to the objects. The whole form of our knowledge we derive from ourselves. When we say that an experience A is related to an experience B by the principle of causation, this principle of causation exists only in ourselves. We attach it to the two experiences A and B. We, therefore, attach causality to things. <coughs> this brings us to a startling conclusion though it is startling chiefly because of the widespread authority which attaches to Kant's philosophy. However, we cannot avoid it. It is this. Kant seeks the principle of certainty by denying that we derive the content of our knowledge from objects, and by asserting that we derive it from ourselves and then apply it to objects. In other words, and here the paradox is manifest, we have truth because we make it for ourselves. But the truth that we have is only subjective truth because we ourselves bring it into existence and then apply it to objects. There you have the final consequence of nominalism. The scholastics strove with the problem of the universal concepts, with the question, quote, what is the actual form of reality in the outer world of that which we receive into ourselves in the form of ideas, close quote. They could not arrive at a solution of the problem which satisfied them. Kant says, quote, Very well, ideas are only names. We fashion them in ourselves and then attach them to the objects as names. In that way, the ideas become realities. They may, in point of fact, be far from real. Nevertheless, if, when I confront the objects, I apply names to my experience of them, and so make it real, then the experience must, must possess the reality which I impose upon it by attaching to it a name. Close quote. Thus Kantianism brings nominalism to its fullest development, its final conclusions. It is also the lowest ebb of Western philosophy, the complete bankruptcy of man in his search for the truth, a despair that man can in any way find truth in external objects. The dictate is issued that truth can exist only if we ourselves introduce it into objects. Kant has destroyed all objective truth, all possibility of man penetrating to the reality in objects. Indeed, he has destroyed all possibility of knowledge, all possibility of searching for the truth, for truth cannot exist if it can only be created subjectively. <clears throat> this situation has resulted from scholasticism, just because the scholastics had not been able to turn in another direction, where a fresh boundary was waiting to be crossed. The age of natural science emerged, and scholasticism was not adjusted to it. In consequence, Kantianism eventually came on the scene, developing, in point of fact, into a subjectivism in which all knowledge is extinguished. From this subjectivism there finally sprouted the so-called postulates, in quotes, freedom, in quotes, immortality, and the, in quotes, idea of God. We are meant to do what is right, to obey the categorical imperative. Therefore, we must be able to do so. Therefore, we must be free. But we cannot be free while we are living here in our physical body. We shall only attain the perfection which will enable us to carry out in full the categorical imperative 
when we are free of our body. Therefore there must also be immortality. But as human beings we cannot attain to that. If we are to do what we should, the whole duty of man in the world must be laid down for us by a Godhead. Therefore there must be a Godhead. Three postulates of faith, concerning which there can be no certainty as to how far they are rooted in reality. That is the extent of the certainty reached by Kant. As he himself expressed it, quote, I had to annihilate knowledge in order to make room for faith. Close quote. <laughs> Even so, he does not make room for a faith content, as it was understood by Thomas Aquinas, a faith content handed down by tradition, but for an abstract faith content. Quote, freedom, immortality, and the idea of God, close quote, begotten by the individual human being out of the truth, or rather the semblance of truth, which he had dictated. In this way Kant brought nominalism to its logical conclusion. Among philosophers he is the one who really denies man everything which would enable him to penetrate to any kind of reality. It was this fact that caused the reaction against Kant which appeared in Fichte and Schelling and then Hegel, and later in other thinkers of the 19th century. If we look at Fichte, for example, we see that everything which Kant had set up as a world of appearance or illusion, Fichte wished to derive from the creative ego itself, which, however, he regarded as rooted in the sense world. One can see, too, how he was drawn to a more intense one might even say an increasingly mystical soul experience, in order to escape from Kantianism. Fichte could not even believe that Kant could have meant what is contained in his critiques. At first, with a certain philosophic naivete, he expressed the belief that Kant was only concerned with the final conclusions of his own philosophy. What Fichte meant was that apart from these final conclusions, one could only believe that this philosophy had been pieced together by some amazing chance, certainly not by a thoughtful human brain. All this philosophic speculation stands quite apart from the movement in Western civilization occasioned by the growth of natural science, which appeared upon the scene as a sort of reaction in the middle of the 19th century. <clears throat> this movement knew nothing at all of philosophy, and therefore, in the case of many thinkers, degenerated into rank materialism. Meanwhile, the stream of philosophy continued to flow until the last third of the century, when it almost completely dried up. Then every possible theory which could be derived or assumed from Kantianism and similar philosophies was used in an attempt to grasp the nature of the reality present in the outer world. Now, the world outlook of Goethe, had it been understood, would have been of vital importance at that time and would have met exactly the need of the moment, but it had been completely lost for the 19th century, except among thinkers of the school of Fichte, Schelling and Hegel. In the world outlook of Goethe is to be found what Thomism must become if it is to rise to the highest possibilities of the present time and play a real part in the evolution of mankind. But if it is to do this, it must make a new approach to natural science. Thomas Aquinas could get no further than the bare affirmation that the psychic spiritual element has an actual effect on every activity of the human organism. He expressed expressed it thus, quote, Everything in the human body, even down to the vegetative activities, is occasioned and directed by the soul forces and must be understood in that light. Close quote. Goethe took the first step in the new approach to natural science in his titled Theory of Colors, which in consequence is not really understood. He followed this up in his title Morphology and in his title Theory of Plants and Animals. Goethe's ideas, however, will not be brought to fulfillment until we have a spiritual science which can of itself provide an explanation of the facts of natural science. <laughs> Footnote C. F. Rudolf Steiner, 
titled Man's Fall and Redemption, page 8, and a footnote. In other lectures, I have tried to show how spiritual science seeks to oppose and correct some of the conclusions of natural science, for example, with regard to the theory of the heart. The materialistic, mechanistic view likens the heart to a pump which drives the blood through the human body. The opposite is the truth. The circulating blood is a living entity, as can be proved by embryology, and the blood moved by its own inner force sets the heart in action. The heart is the instrument by means of which the blood activity expresses itself and integrates itself into the whole life of the human being. The activity of the heart is a consequence of the blood activity and not vice versa. In the same way, as has been set out in detail in my lectures for doctors, footnote, title, Spiritual Science and Medicine, and a footnote, it can be shown, in regard to each organ of the body, how the realization that man is a spiritual being explains the working of his material organism. Thus we can, in a way, make real that which appeared dimly in more or less abstract form in Thomism, when it said, quote, the spiritual psychic permeates the whole physical body, close quote. That now becomes knowledge of real concrete fact. The Thomistic philosophy, which in the 13th century expressed itself only in abstract form by rekindling itself from Goethe, lives on in our day as spiritual science. Let me illustrate this by a personal experience. When at the end of the 80s I spoke in the Vienna Goethe Society on the subject of, quote, Goethe as the father of a new aesthetic, close quote, there was in the audience a very learned Cistercian. I had explained how we must regard Goethe's presentation of art and after my lecture, this Cistercian, whose name was Father Wilhelm Neumann, and who was a professor of theology at Vienna University, made this curious remark, quote, The germ of this address, which you have given us today, is to be found in Thomas Aquinas. Close quote. It was an extraordinarily interesting experience for me to hear from Father Wilhelm Neumann that he had found in Thomism something like a germ of what I had said to be the consequence of Goethe's world outlook in relation to aesthetics. For Father Neumann was himself highly trained in Thomism, as Neo-Thomism had already arisen amongst the clergy of the Roman Catholic Church. The fact of the matter is that things appear quite differently when seen in the light of truth than they do when seen under the influence of a lifeless nominalistic philosophy which is largely derived from Kant and the modern physiology based on him. Spiritual science can provide many examples of this. For instance, in my book titled Riddles of the Soul, I attempted, as a result of thirty years' study of the problem, to explain the human being as a threefold entity and to show how each part is related to a psychic activity. One part of the physical human body, the brain and nerve system, is connected with the thought and sense-perceptive activity. The rhythmic system, all that pertains to the breathing and heart rhythms, is connected with the feeling of emotion activity. And finally, the digestive and metabolic system is connected with the will activity. The attempt is made throughout to rediscover the spiritual psychic as an active creative force working in man. In all this we are deliberately making the new approach to natural science, of which I have been speaking. Just as, before the age of Thomistic scholasticism, an attempt was made, as we saw in the Areopagite and Plotinus, to penetrate, by means of human cognition, into the realm of spirit. So, now, following the age of natural science, spiritual science is attempting to penetrate by the same means into the realm of the essential being of nature. In this new approach, we take the Christ principle seriously. 
The scholastics would have done the same thing had they grasped the truth that human thought can evolve and raise itself to a higher level once it discards the idea of the inescapable limitation of knowledge as a result of the fall, and through pure sense-free thinking develops upward to the spirit world. The appearance of nature as we see it can be penetrated as the veil only of its true being. Then we shall press on beyond the boundary of knowledge with philosophical do excuse me, then we shall press on beyond the boundary of knowledge which philosophical dualism has believed it necessary to set up, just as the scholastics believed it necessary from their point of view. And when we penetrate beneath the surface of this material world, we discover that it is in fact a spiritual world, and that behind the veil of nature the ultimate realities are not material atoms, but spiritual beings. This shows how thought, by evolving to a higher level, can achieve the development of the Thomism of the Middle Ages to meet the needs of the day. Consider, for example, those most important psychological theories of Albertus and Thomas Aquinas. Certainly, they do not penetrate so far into the physical constitution of man as to be able to say how the spirit or the soul works on the separate organs, such as the heart, the spleen, or the liver. But already they point out that the whole human body must be regarded as having originated from the spiritual psychic. This thought must now be carried to a further stage by the endeavor actually to trace the spiritual psychic into each separate part of the physical organism. Philosophy does not attempt to do this, nor natural science. It will only be achieved by a spiritual science, which does not hesitate to reintroduce into our own day the great thoughts which have played so vital a part in the evolution of humanity, such as those of the scholastics, and apply them to all that the scientific outlook of our day has discovered. If, however, this task is to be dealt with in a scientific way, it necessitates a complete divorce from Kantianism. This I attempted in the first place in my little book titled Truth and Science and then in the eighties of the last century in my book titled A Theory of Knowledge Based on Goethe's World Outlook and later still in my title Philosophy of Spiritual Activity. Quite shortly and without regard for the fact that things of this sort appear more difficult when they are presented briefly I should like to put before you the basic ideas to be found in these books. They start from the unquestionable fact that in the world, merely as we perceive it, spread out around us, truth cannot directly be found. Indeed, one can understand in a way how the human soul was captured by nominalism and how it came to accept the false conclusions of Kantianism. It is quite plain that Kant himself never saw the point with which my books make a serious attempt to deal. It is this, a consideration of the actual world of sense experience, if it is made objectively and thoroughly, leads to the knowledge that this world as we perceive it with our senses is not complete in itself, and that it is brought to a state of full reality only through ourselves. Let us consider once more exactly how the difficulty of nominalism and the whole of Kantianism arises. It arises in this way. Man takes the sense world and observes it, and then, through the working of his soul life, he attaches to it the world of ideas. As a result of this, it appears to him that this ideal world must be a picture of the outer world. On the other hand, he perceives that the ideal world exists within himself. What relation can there be between this ideal world man finds in himself and the world outside him? This was the question, and the only answer Kant could find to it was this. Quote, in attaching our ideal world to the outer world which we perceive, we create truth. 
close quote. But Kant was wrong. The facts are these. If we consider the act of sense perception with an unprejudiced mind, we find that, in itself, it is incomplete, that in every way it is not self-sufficient. I strove hard to prove this, first in my thesis, titled Truth and Science, and later in my title, Philosophy of Spiritual Activity. By the fact that we have been placed in the world, born into the world, we split the actual world of reality in two. Footnotes, the Appendix 5, titled The Philosophy of Spiritual Activity, page 173, end of footnote. It is true that in one sense we have the whole world content here with us, but owing to the way in which we are placed as human beings in the world, we split the world content into the, quote, percept world, close quote, which appears to us from the outside, and the, quote, idea world, close quote, which appears to us from within our own soul. Owing to the manner of our existence in the world, the world is for us divided into a percept world and an idea world. Whoever regards this division as absolute and says to himself, quote, the world is over there and I am here, close quote, will never be able to unite his idea world with the percept world. Footnote rather long. 2. In another series of lectures titled From Jesus to Christ, Steiner shows how this sundering of macrocosm and microcosm prevents a true understanding of Christ and his work and the realization of spiritual reality. Quote, as long as we stand on the ground on which theologians of the nineteenth century actually stood, that the spiritual evolution of man is something which takes its course purely in the inner being of man, something which has, so to speak, nothing to do with the external world of the macrocosm, we cannot reach an objective understanding of Jesus Christ at all. We come to all kinds of grotesque ideas, but never to a relationship with the Christ event. To the man who believes that he can reach the highest human ideal conformable to earth evolution merely by an inner soul path through a kind of self-redemption, to him an objective relationship with Christ is impossible. Wherever the problem of the redemption of man is thought of as something that can be solved by psychology, there is no relationship to the Christ. He who penetrates into cosmic mysteries soon finds that when a man believes that he can attain his highest ideal of earth existence solely through himself, solely through his own inner development, he cuts off altogether his connection with the macrocosm. For such a man the macrocosm stands before him as a kind of nature and his inner soul development is something alongside of the macrocosm, running parallel with it. But a connection between the two he cannot find. This sundering of microcosm and macrocosm has led man to pay but little attention to the inner soul life, even to the extent of assigning the inner soul life, as well as the outer corporeality, to the macrocosm, thus making everything subject to material processes. Others, aware that there is nevertheless an inner life, have fallen gradually into abstractions concerning everything that relates to the human soul. Quote. In a recent book, Dr. Agnes Arbler writes of this cleavage in science, quote, By sheer natural necessity, the intellect, like the body, seeks in the universe for that which is so far conformable to itself that it can be integrated into its very texture. If we may accept the Pythagorean saying that, quote, man is the measure of all things, close quote, it is open to us to believe that such a craving in man, the microcosm, is an indication that in the universe, the macrocosm, there is a corresponding element which the mind searches after and finds. Unfortunately, the profound influence of Descartes in biology has tended to neutralize this natural and inherent urge, 
he impressed a surgical cleavage so persuasively and so effectually upon scientific thought that the breach he made has never been satisfactorily closed. Close quote. Agnes Arbler titled The Mind and the Eye, EYE, A Study of the Biologist's Standpoint. End of footnote. The true solution of the problem is this. I look at the percept world. It is everywhere incomplete. Everywhere something is lacking. I receive an endless number of unrelated impressions. Now I myself with my whole being have come into existence out of the same universe to which this percept world also belongs. So I look into myself and I see in myself just that which the percept world lacks, namely ideas, relationships arrived at by thinking. I must, therefore, through my own being, reunite that which for me, as a result of my coming into the world, has divided itself into two parts. I gain reality by my own effort. Owing to the fact of my being born as I am into the world, that which is really one appears to have branched into two parts, that given by outward perception, and the world of ideas. By living and growing and developing my being, I unite the two streams of reality in the process of acquiring knowledge. I myself achieve reality. As a result of fact, excuse me, as a matter of fact, I should never have attained self-consciousness had I not, by the way in which I entered the world, divided the world of ideas from the outer world of perception. Footnotes the Appendix 5, The Philosophy of Spiritual Activity, that's the title, page 175, end of footnote. But I should never find the bridge to the real world if I did not bring the idea world, which I have separated off in myself once more into unity with that which without the idea world is no reality at all. Kant seeks reality in outer perception alone and never suspects that one half of reality is in ourselves, namely the idea world which we carry within us and which is thus detached from the reality of the external world. Footnote. Kant was aware of the world of ideas, but regarded it as entirely man's creation, which he attaches to the external world for his own convenience, but which has no inherent relation to it. In this way man, quote-unquote, creates reality. Steiner, in the title Philosophy of Spiritual Activity, shows that the world of ideas is itself a part of the objective reality of the world. In attaching it to the percept world, man does not create but restores reality, and in so doing, discovers it. End of footnote. Once this is realized, nominalism is completely abolished, for we are no longer spreading the forms of space and time and ideas, which we regard as mere names, over our external percepts. But in the act of knowledge, we are returning to our percepts that which we, quote, separated from them, close quote, on entering into our sense existence. In this way, the relation of man to the spiritual world becomes evident to us in a purely philosophical form. Whoever reads my title, The Philosophy of Spiritual Activity, uh, the, uh, aside by the reader, this is on the website, but it's titled Intuitive Thinking as a Spiritual Path is the name of the book in the newest edition. End of my aside. Let me read that again. Whoever reads my title, Philosophy of Spiritual Activity, will find that it is entirely based on the theory of knowledge, which holds that for man, reality is attained by human effort in the activity of thinking. Thus, human knowledge is the gateway into the actual experience of reality. The very title of my earlier book, Truth and Science, expresses the fundamental idea that true science unites percepts with the world of ideas and that this union is not 
a merely abstract process, but one that takes place in the world of actual fact. Whoever can accept these ideas and can see the union of percepts and the world of ideas as something that really happens is in a position not only to overcome Kantianism, but to find at last the solution to the problem, the development of which we have followed in Western history, the problem of individuality, of human ego consciousness. It was this problem which was really responsible for nominalism, and although in the scholasticism of the 13th century it produced some brilliant thinkers, they finally stood powerless before the gulf between perception and the idea world. Now this problem of individuality brings us into the realm of ethics. In this way too my philosophy of spiritual activity is a philosophy of reality. Just as we have shown that knowledge is not merely an act in the abstract meaning of the word but an event related to objective reality, so ethics moral behavior is shown to be something which the individual as he passes through the events of this real knowledge process experiences intuitively through his moral imagination as objectively real. Thus there arises what is presented in the second part of my philosophy of spiritual activity as quote ethical individualism close quote which is in reality founded upon the Christ impulse in man, although this is not expressed in the book. There it is based upon the free spiritual activity which man achieves by changing ordinary thinking into what in my book I call, quote, pure thinking, close quote. This pure thinking, then, raises itself to the direct experience of the spiritual world and derives from it the impulses to moral behavior. This is due to the fact that in the spiritual activity of pure thinking, the impulse of love, which otherwise is bound up with man's physical nature, spiritualizes itself. And when the moral imagination discovers the ethical ideals as actual realities in the spiritual world, this spiritualized love becomes the power by means of which they express themselves. It was for this reason that I had to oppose the Philistinism of Kant, which exclaimed, quote, Duty, thou exalted name, that seekest no flattery, but demandest strict obedience, close quote. Schiller had <coughs> already revolted against this Philistine idea, in the philosophy of spiritual activity, I set up in its place the, quote, transformed ego, close quote, which, having raised itself up into the spiritual sphere, there begins to love virtue and practices it because in its own individual being it loves it. Thus we have as a real world content what for Kant remains always only a content of faith. For Kant, knowledge is a matter of abstract theory. For the philosophy of spiritual activity, it is something real, an actual process. <laughs> In the same way, too, the higher morality is bound up with a reality to which pragmatists like Windelbant and Rickert never attain, because they do not see that moral values are rooted in world reality. Naturally, those who do not regard the process of knowledge as a real process are quite incapable of finding an anchorage for morality in the sense world and arrive at no philosophy of reality at all. The basic philosophical principles of what I am presenting as spiritual science I have, in fact, drawn from the actual history of Western philosophical development. I have tried to show that the Cistercian father was not mistaken, and in what way an attempt must be made by means of spiritual science to introduce into our present age of natural science the elements of scholasticism that deal with the nature of reality. I have laid special stress upon the quote-unquote transformation of the human soul, 
and upon the necessity of its being really filled with the Christ impulse, even in its thought life. The life of knowledge has been shown to be a real factor in world evolution, which takes place entirely on the stage of human consciousness, as I set out in my book titled Goethe's World Outlook. But this, which takes place on the stage of human consciousness, is at the same time a cosmic happening, a real event in world history. Moreover, it is just this event that carries forward toward its fulfillment the world and ourselves within it. In this way, the problem of knowledge acquires an entirely new aspect. Our daily experience becomes a real factor in our spiritual psychic development, and it proceeds out of what we call knowledge. Just as a magnet works on a group of iron filings, forming them into patterns which we recognize as the result of the action of the magnet on the filings, so that which is reflected in us as knowledge is at the same time a formative principle in us, working upon us and enabling us to recognize the immortal, the eternal, in ourselves. No longer does the problem of knowledge present itself to us as merely formal. How then ought the problem of knowledge to be stated? Kant and his followers always stated thus, quote, How does man come to see within him a picture of the outer world. Close quote. But the primary reason for the existence of thinking is not that it should make pictures of the outer world, but that it should bring to full development our being. That it portrays to us the outer world is a secondary process. In the same way, the fact that in the outer world we join together by our knowledge that which by our birth we have divided into two parts is also a secondary process. The modern attitude to the problem of knowledge is exactly as though a man who wished to study the true nature of the principle of growth in wheat or some other crop on his land was to proceed to study the food value of the wheat. It is, of course, useful to be an expert in food values, but the understanding of the process of growth in the wheat from the ear right back to the root and further still will never be known through the chemistry of food values. That only investigates something which is an accompaniment of the actual continuous stream of growth which is present in the wheat plant. In the same way, there exists in us a stream of spirit growth which is present in us as a force and is related to our being, just like the stream of growth in the plant from the root through the stem and the leaf to the flower and the fruit and then back again to the seed and the root. And just as the fact that we eat it can never afford a true explanation of the actual nature of the principle of growth in the plant, so the question of the practical knowledge value of that which lives in us as an evolutionary impulse must not be made the basis of a philosophy of knowledge. Rather, it must become clear to us that what is called knowledge in ordinary life is only a secondary effect of the working of thought on man's being. Thus, we arrive at the reality that is inherent in thinking. It is an activity that is at work within us. The falsehood of nominalism and Kantianism only arose because they stated the problem of knowledge in the same way as a man might try to state the problem of the essential nature of wheat from the point of view of the science of food values. Once we realize all that Thomism can be for our time and for our modern age, and that its revival must spring out of its great achievements in the Middle Ages, then we shall see in spiritual science Thomism in its twentieth century form. 
spiritual science will appear as the true revival of Thomism. This throws light on the problem of our attitude to those who say, quote, modern philosophy must return to Thomas Aquinas and he must be studied, possibly with a few critical explanations and so forth, just as he wrote it in the 13th century. Close quote. We can distinguish clearly between the point of view which honestly and sincerely places itself in the stream of the evolution of thought which flowed from scholasticism and that which places itself back in the 13th century, overlooking everything which has taken place in the evolution of humanity in Europe since that time. Footnote, quote, Protestant theologians, rightly or wrongly, get the impression that to a Catholic theologian the theology of St. Thomas and precisely in its scholastic form, rather than the teaching of the faith by the Church, has the final word. It was one of the merits of St. Thomas that in his time, against all conventions and consequently amid strong opposition, he proposed problems anew in a manner demanded by the thought of his time. Would he, at the present time, with its totally new problems and data, have bound himself to a form that no longer has any meaning for anyone outside the Catholic world? Close quote. W. H. Van de Paul, titled The Christian Dilemma, translated by G. Van Hall, page 181, end of footnote. I will not begin to discuss here the question where Thomism is really to be found. It would be like discussing the question as to whether the rose which I have before me would be better understood if I were to disregard the flower and only dig in the ground and examine the roots, overlooking the fact that something has sprung already from the roots, or if I were to examine all that has sprung from those roots, I will leave you to answer that question yourselves. We have, however, before us two points of view, that which announces itself as a revival of Thomism, just as it was in the thirteenth century and that which desires to keep abreast of the evolution of Western Europe. We must put to ourselves the question, quote, in which of these does Thomism really live in the world of today? Close quote. We can answer it by another question, quote, what was Thomas Aquinas's own attitude to the problem before him at that time, the problem of the revelation content of religion? Close quote. He sought to find the right thought relationship to it. Our need today is to find the right thought relationship to the scientifically revealed content of nature. Since the 13th century, when St. Thomas wrote, there have been profound changes in the conception of the material world, which have had repercussions on the philosophy of physics. Fundamental notions, such as those of matter, causality, and design, have taken new forms, and consequently there have been changes in the status and interpretation of the initial assumptions from which his arguments proceed. We may be assured that if he were alive now, he would start from the science of nature as we know it, a science that is immediately richer than was dreamt of in his day, and that he would show how it could be gathered into the framework of divine knowledge. Close quote, Sir Edmund Whitaker, titled Space and Spirit, Chapter I. End of footnote. In this we cannot be held up by dogmatic theory. As I wrote thirty years ago, we must overcome dogmatism in empirical science today, just as much as, on the other hand, we must overcome dogmatism in revealed religion. We must consider anew, in a completely factual way, the spiritual psychic content of man, the thought world which receives into itself the transforming Christ principle, in order that through the Christ in us, that is in our thought world, we may discover again the spiritual world. Are we to rest content with leaving our thought world alone at the level to which the fall of man has brought it? Shall man's thought world have no part in human redemption? In the thirteenth century, no place could be found in the thought world for the principle of Christian redemption, and therefore the thought world was regarded as quite apart 
from the world of revelation. The future advance of mankind will be realized by discovering the principle of redemption, not only for the outer world, but also for human reason. The redeemed human reason could never raise itself into the spirit, excuse me, the unredeemed human reason could never raise itself into the spiritual world. It is only the redeemed human reason which possesses the true relationship to the Christ that can win its way into the world of spirit. To enter the kingdom of the spirit in this way is the Christianity of the 20th century. But it must be a Christianity strong enough to penetrate to the very core of human thinking and human soul experience. This is not pantheism, nor any of those things on the score of which spiritual science is calumniated. It is genuine Christianity. You can see from this study of the philosophy of Thomas Aquinas, even if in certain instances it has been necessary to digress into the realm of the abstract, with what seriousness spiritual science is concerned with the problems of the West, and how it will always take its stand on the ground of the present age and on no other, whatever attacks may be brought against it. These lectures have been given in order to demonstrate that one of the peaks of European spiritual evolution is manifest in the scholasticism of the thirteenth century, and that this present age has every reason to study this period and will discover that there is an endless amount to be learned from it. This is especially so in what we must call, in the full sense of the words, the deepening of our thought life, so that we may completely abandon nominalism and experience the permeation of our thought life by Christ. That will be a Christianity which will lead us to that spirit being from whom all man must have derived his being. For if man is quite honest and sincere with himself, nothing else can satisfy him but the consciousness of his own spiritual origin.